and forth verse again, just because they're so good. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Well, good morning, church. It is a blessing to be able to open God's Word on a Sunday morning. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church. And it really is a blessing to be able to dive deep into God's Word and to see what He has to say. Uh, we'd love to see you at Physical Church. We have a service at 10 a.m. at 26 Norwood Street at Flemington. Uh, please join us. Get connected with the links down below. Uh, we'd love to see you there on a Sunday morning. Uh, we're starting a new series on the book of Revelation. We're looking at seven sermons on the seven letters to the seven churches. And I do pray as we go through the seven letters that you'd be encouraged and challenged in your faith. I know the book of Revelation is an interesting book, and so I do hope that it really does uh, uh, interest you and that uh, it would whet your appetite uh, to want to know more about what God has to say. I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. And then I'm going to pray and then we'll look at God's word together. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. This is God's word. Uh, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lamps, stands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lamp stamp from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, we really need you to give us ears to hear. Help us to understand. Help us to be transformed by your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 2. Verses 1 to 7, falling out of love with the gospel. Well, the question every preacher will ask is, uh, where do I begin when we start a series on the book of Revelation? Where do I begin? And there's so much to say about the book of Revelation. It is complex, and there's so many different views and interpretations for this book. Uh, what I want to do, is I want to simply look at seven sermons on the seven letters to the seven churches. I don't want to dwell too much on certain aspects of the, of the letter and the text, um, because I don't think it will be helpful, but we're going to look at it briefly. We're going to see what God has to say to us, 
And um, I really do hope we can be encouraged and challenged in our faith. Uh, The letters give us a great example of churches which do some good things and some bad things. And I'm hoping that our church can learn um, the good things and we can fight against the bad things. And maybe in a Bible study or sermon series in the later, later we can tackle some of the more complicated things in the book. Uh, but I do want to mention a few things before we look at one of the letters. Uh, one of the most important things about interpreting any book of the Bible is figuring out what genre of literature it is. Uh, for example, we have narrative, like Genesis and Exodus. We have poetry, we have epistles. Uh, the style of the book will help shape our understanding of the book and our text. Uh, the book of Revelation is interesting because it contains at least three different types of genres uh, that blend in into one uh, to give us um, an ex- uh, uh, help us to understand who Jesus Christ is. Uh, the first genre is it's apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. It has lots of visions and imagery. It deals with the end times and the spiritual world meaning not every single bit of the book of Revelation should be read literally. Uh, There are some people who try to calculate days and years and try to match up things, and they miss the point of the book. They miss the style of the book. It's apocalyptic. And so we have to understand that it's apocalyptic. It's also prophetic. It speaks to the people of the first century, the 21st century. It gives us aspects. Uh, it talks about um, the insights from God, about history in this book. And so it deals with some um, parts of history in it, and things to come. And finally, it also has aspects of an epistle, a letter. And that's going to be really true, especially because we're going to be looking at the seven letters to the seven churches. In Revelations chapter 2 and 3, we have seven letters to seven churches. And um, if you see on uh, on the map I'm holding right now, or uh, maybe on the map that I'm going to put up one somewhere here, uh, you will see that I put in uh, the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you'll see where it is in the map. But um, the churches are in modern-day Turkey. Um, And each layer, they follow a similar structure. It begins with an introduction, which connects to Revelation 1. It's an introduction uh, which simply says that these things are the words of Jesus to a particular church. Uh, We won't spend time in any of our sermons trying to understand the introduction, Um, These introductions are repetitions of Revelation 1, and we can look at them next time. Uh, But each of these letters are Jesus' diagnosis of the church. Uh, Four of the churches do great things, but also have some faults. Uh, They are what we call mixed bags. Four churches are mixed bags. Two churches have only good things to be said about them, and one church has only bad things to be said about them. And then each letter ends with a promise and a conclusion. That's the structure of the letters. An introduction from Jesus and who he is, uh, the good or the bad things about the church, the diagnosis, and then a promise and a conclusion. And today we begin at the letter of Ephesus. Ephesus Ephesus was one of the most important of the seven cities. Uh, Though Pergamum was apparently the official capital city, capital of the province of Asia, Ephesus was its greatest city. A lot of things happened in Ephesus. Um, In Acts, we see that Paul spent over two years in Ephesus establishing the church, and we also have the letter to the church of Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. And so what does Jesus have to say to this church? What does he have to say to them? Well, we're going to look at their commendation and then their criticism. So the commendation What does Jesus commend them for? Look at verses 2 and 3. Verses 2 and 3, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. This is a church. The church of Ephesus is a church which does things. They work hard, they toil, they do good things. They also persevere in hardship and suffering. 
They have patience and patient endurance. And notice at the end of verse 2, they hate evil and face false apostles. They pursue biblical truth. This is a church which does good works and they pursue biblical truth. Uh, later in verse 6, it says, Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, we don't know much about the Nicolaitans, except that Jesus hated them. They were heretical, and the church of Ephesus stood firm on their belief. They were, they were firm on biblical truth. Uh, this is a good thing. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, when we match ourselves with the church of Ephesus, do we pursue God, God's work in our lives and our church? Are we a church which is interested in serving God and His people? You see, the church of Ephesus challenges us to examine our life and the life and culture of the church, the life and culture of St. Stephen's. Are we a church which is interested in pursuing God's work? And we need to really ask ourselves, uh, how are we serving God today in our church? How are you serving today in St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church? And maybe today you look at your life and you might think you're not doing much. Please have a chat with me. Please have a chat with me after the service on YouTube, wherever it is, because there are a million things which can be done in our church for God's glory. And for those who are working hard, toiling for the gospel, praise God and continue to serve God in ways you can. Praise God. Jesus Christ commends you for that. But how about patient, and patient endurance? In our church context, we don't have much uh, persecution. Although in the future, like I've mentioned in the past, we are coming to a time where we will be persecuted for standing for biblical truth. And may we be a church like the church of Ephesus, which stands on biblical truth, which knows and can see Harris, uh, who can stand firm on um, persecution. And finally, how about biblical orthodoxy, biblical truth? And the great thing about the Presbyterian Church of Victoria is that we have a theological stance on many things. We uphold the Westminster Confession of Faith in light of the declaratory statement. But you know, we as a local church might not always reflect what our denomination believes. And so we need to work hard in understanding the Bible. We need to work hard in understanding what God has to say so that we can defend ourselves from false teachings. I've actually heard a few things in even our local church, which is not necessarily biblical. And so to be honest, we as a church at St. Stephen, we need to work hard to examine everything. Do you examine every teaching that you read or watch? When you read a post on Facebook, when you watch a sermon on YouTube, do you examine what they say in light of the Bible? The great thing about the church of Ephesus is that they knew biblical truth. They knew God's word. They knew the apostolic teaching. So we need to examine ourselves. We need to be thinking carefully about what we read, what we hear, what we listen to. Now I may be thinking, well, what could be wrong with a church like the church of Ephesus? I mean, the church of Ephesus seems to be serving, doing good works. They are patiently enduring in light of persecution, right? They have good theology. They condemn false teaching. They're able to discern false teaching. What could be wrong with a church like that, right? Sounds like a pretty good church. Please turn with me to verses 4 to 5. Look at verses 4 to 5, and we will see Jesus' criticism for the church of Ephesus. Jesus' criticism, verses 4 to 5, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Isn't that shocking? Here is a church which does great, great works. Here is a church which stands in light of persecution. 
Here is a church which preaches and teaches biblical truth and are able to withstand false teaching. Yet, yet verse 4, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. This is shocking. Somewhere in the midst of sound doctrine and good works, they have fallen out of love with the gospel and the proclamation of the gospel. They have fallen out of love with Jesus Christ and his mission. They have abandoned their love. Abandoned is a strong word, right? We don't want to be abandoned. We don't like hearing uh, stories of people being abandoned. It's a strong word, yet they have abandoned their love. Their first love. And now you'll be asking, how does it happen? What does that look like? How can a church with sound doctrine do good works, yet have fallen out of love with Jesus Christ and faithful witness? What, does that, what that does teach us is that doing good works, serving in the church, patiently enduring in the midst of persecution, and knowing sound doctrine doesn't necessarily mean you love Jesus Christ. There is a deep problem inside of the hearts of the people's hearts in the church of Ephesus. And there's a big problem in some of our hearts. Uh, We don't know exactly what the church of Ephesus looked like, but we do need to examine ourselves. Are we in love with the gospel? Are you in love with the gospel? Are you in love with Jesus Christ? Or have you become like the church of Ephesus, fallen out of love with your first love? Uh, Many of us, when we first become Christians, tell our family and friends about how, how great Jesus is and what he's done. We tell people why we have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ, how he has saved us from our sins. But as time goes by, we barely share our testimony. And when was the last time you shared to someone how Jesus saved you from your sins. We can be faithful in service, yet grow cold in our love for Christ and his people. The church of Ephesus needed to run back to the gospel and reevaluate their love for Jesus. Uh, This is the warning to the church. Because instinctively, even now, you might be sitting there thinking, I love Jesus. I'm not like the church of Ephesus. But the church of Ephesus did so many good things, it looks fine. And so really, we need to be asking the question, are you full of joy because of the gospel? Because Jesus Christ died for your sins because you're a sinner. Are you full of joy because of that? Are you prayerful in your daily life? Are you dependent on God in everything? Are you in love with God's word and do you saturate your life with God's word daily? Are you telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ? Because if we love God, we will communicate with God. We will hear from him, from, hear him speak from his word. We will speak to him through prayer. We'll commit ourselves to him. And if we love God, we will treasure him above all things. We will find joy in him and his promises, and we will serve God by telling people about Jesus Christ. Or do you find joy? Do you find peace in your family and friends and your holidays and your relationships and job? Church, we really need to examine ourselves and whether or not we love Jesus and his people and telling people about Jesus. But that's why I never push anyone to do anything. I believe it's so important to serve out of love for Jesus and the gospel. If we don't have someone to play piano and sing or serve as an usher, then so be it. If we don't have enough elders or board of management members, then so be it. It is better to have people serving because they love Jesus and his people than to be a church which is run by people out of love of the gospel, who are running cold of love. A love of Jesus should drive what we do. 
We can't be zealous in sharing the gospel unless we are in love with the gospel first. And so why? Why do we need to be serious about this? Look again in verse 5. Look at verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lamb stamp from its place unless you repent. They need to repent because they have fallen out of love. And notice, if they don't, Christ will come to remove their lamb stamp. Meaning, Christ will remove their church. If they continue to be cold, to be out of love, the gospel and God's people, and the proclamation of God's word, there is a possibility that Christ will remove them. A scary warning. Yet it's a warning for us. There is a possibility that if we are so cold in our love for Christ and His people and the proclamation of the gospel, Christ will remove us as well. We need to be reminded of Christ's word in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 to 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God and loving others like Jesus. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you enthusiastic about the gospel? If I was going, if I was going to sh- um, begin an evangelistic program in our church, will you be interested in joining? Are you interested in missions and telling people about Jesus? Because if we don't repent and run to Jesus, then we're in trouble. We need to share the good news of Christ and tell people about his salvation. I have to conclude You know, the church of Ephesus might look like a lot of churches. When we look around, it might look like a lot of churches. You might think that looks like our church, maybe. Although there is a great problem with this church, Jesus ends with a great promise. Look at verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Uh, we might not be doing church right. That's the reality. I don't think we necessarily are. But there's a great promise that if we hear the words of Jesus, if we repent and run to the cross, if we confess our sins and our need for a Savior, if we fall in love with Jesus and the gospel and the proclamation of His word, then Christ offers us eternal life. There is hope even for a church which has fallen out of love with the gospel. And there are many churches which really have run cold. And maybe today we as a church have run cold. Maybe today you have run cold. May we be a church and people who love him and his people. May we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. May we love our neighbors as ourselves for glory, God's glory's sake. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, we really don't want to fall out of love with you. Father, help the gospel uh, rejuvenate our love for you. Help us to be reminded of the gospel. May the gospel shape all that we do and all that we say. May we be a church, a church which loves you and serves you in all that we can. And for some who may have fallen out of love, may you bring them into repentance and may you draw them closer to yourself. May they find eternal life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
high.